Hey everybody, how are you doing tonight? Thank you for coming to our May meeting. It's May 2021 and this is the Conradina chapter of the Native Plant Society. Uh, I'm the current president, Carol Hebert. And on behalf of all the Conradina officers and board members, we hope that everyone is staying healthy and happy and safe. And we're really looking forward to eventually not being virtual, um, but we're keeping it that way until we get a room available. So we'll keep you posted on that. Um, always check, you know, our website is doing really good. Uh, Conradina.fnpschapters.org. And you can check on our website. It'll also send you right to YouTube, um, which hopefully you're watching right now. Um, but also it gives you kind of a, like a ton of great information about what we're up to. Uh, Florida Native Plant Society does promote the preservation, conservation, and restoration of the native plants and native plant communities of Florida. And as always, I have to introduce uh, and call out the names of our board members and co-officers. And of course, I'm Carol Hebert, and we have Joe Sarmiento as vice president. Jane Higgins is our wonderful treasurer. Catherine Mary has stepped in there for the uh, secretary. And on to our board members. We have wonderful people, and they're they're they've been hidden all these times because of the virtual. So, but we're still all working very hard, um, putting things together. Suzanne Valencia, Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart is also our uh, state representative for our, our chapter. Uh, Sharon Dolan, Bo Platt, Jim Baldwin, Karen Moser, <clears throat> excuse me, Dave Zeiss, <clears throat> Carl Weinbarger, Linda Grassi, Leonard McRae, Stuart Weimer, Sarah. Morrison and Cami Donaldson. So we've got a great bunch and um, they're under the table right now, but they really do a lot of stuff. So we appreciate it. Uh, tonight, we've got wonderful members of speakers. Uh, we do have Anna Hudson and Tim Harrison, and they are the owners of the Native Plant Florida Nursery. And they're going to talk about the best plants for your butterfly garden. So that's really exciting. Um, we're really lucky that in Brevard that we do have a couple of nurseries. Um, and oh my gosh. Um, I hear, I, I am hearing that people are hearing you guys talk to and Anna. So hold your breath till you're on the show. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> um, so definitely uh, it's, it's great that you can go out and buy native plants. And we have a bunch of different nurseries, well, a handful. Um, but a good selection. And so you can, again, go to our website and see them, support them, get some plants in your yard. All right. Um, please mark your calendar because next month on June 13th, it's a Sunday, it's a Sunday, June 13th, we're going to have our general meeting at Erna Nixon Park, which we've done for years and years. Um, it's a really fun event. Uh, but this time it's not going to be a big buffet and don't bring a potluck dinner. We want you to bring your own lunch. We're going to still be a little bit hesitant on sharing things. So please bring your own lunch. Um, we're going to start actually at 11 o'clock in the morning. And that's if you'd really like to come and attend our board meeting. So we're going to do our board meeting at 11 a.m. And then we're going to start you know, we got huge tables. If you've never been to Erna Nixon Park, the pavilion is wonderful with very big tables. So we'll all space ourselves apart and enjoy a nice meal there. Um, that way too, we're going to eventually be looking for new board members or even officers. This way you'll kind of see a board meeting and just casually hear what we're saying and what we talk, talk about and discuss. And then, um, We'll have a great time chatting a little bit with our lunch. And then if you only want to come to the tour, we're going to plan a little bit after that. I don't know, maybe we'll give ourselves at least an hour to eat. 
And so maybe if you just want to come in and, um, you know, participate with the tour, afterwards we are going to do the tour at Erna Nixon Park. It has a beautiful boardwalk, um, maybe about three quarters of a mile, um, but it's really diverse. And if you've never been there, it might even be the butterfly orchids in bloom. So it's really a, a fun time. And again, we'll be keeping our distance. Please wear a mask. Please wear a mask. Obviously, we can't be eating with one, but um, we just all want to be safe. We want to stay very healthy. So pencil that in and you'll see it on our newsletter also. The other announcement before we get to our speakers is we are in action for our upcoming Landscaping with Florida Natives Garden Tour. Um, we've been doing this for 12 years. And this October the 16th, it's a Saturday, October 16th, 2021, uh, is when our garden tour will take place. And this year we'll actually be in person. Because in a garden nowadays and by October, we're hoping a lot of people are vaccinated more than likely, we are still going to require you have a mask, but still, this way you'll actually see the plants. You'll see what's going on. This one's placed there. It's under the sun. Wow, that's a wet spot. You'll see all these things in action. So we really are looking forward to that. Um, so we have all the gardens picked out, but now we need volunteers to help us. So please contact Cami Donaldson. And look on our website and you will see how you can uh, contact her, has her phone number, has her email address. Um, just go again to the conradina.fnpschapters.org and it's right there when you go down and read about the garden tour. Um, but if you just don't get it, you can always just go under contacts. Carol, where is she? How can I volunteer? Please sign me up. So we'd love to hear from you. And just a little tip that the best part is all homeowners and all volunteers have Sunday to get together and do a secret tour of all those houses. So even the homeowners that are like, oh, I want to know how he or she, you know, did their yard and the volunteers too, we all go together and look at each and every yard on Sunday. So get ready and volunteer. We really appreciate that. Well, I think we should get on to our wonderful speakers. And tonight... If I may introduce, here is Anna Hudson and Tim Harrison, and they are the owners of the Native Butterfly Garden Nursery. Native <laughs> Butterfly Flowers, excuse me. There you go. <laughs> oh, Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Hi, Carol. Great to have you guys here tonight. Um, oh. We're really looking forward to, I got a little preview. Oh, man, the pictures are great. So. I'm going to go ahead and just introduce you guys and let you guys then take it over, okay? All right. Um, Tim Harrison has a bachelor's in conservation uh, ecology, and he's been working as a landscape designer and a horticulturist in Georgia and Florida since 2005. Anna Hudson has a bachelor's in the forest management and conservation and has worked as an eco tour guide in Florida's natural ecosystems and as an environmental educator in Alachua and Brevard counties. Welcome to you both. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you for inviting us. And thank you My for God. inviting us to Conradina. <laughs> Conradina <laughs> chapters <laughs> meetings. So we're so happy to be here. Very um, good. Well, we're going to look forward to it, and um, I'm going to go ahead and just pop up your display of what you plant matters and let you guys take off. All right. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. And so you did already introduce us. I'm Anna, and this is Tim. And we have um, the Native Butterfly Flowers Nursery here in um, West Melbourne. Um, we grow our plants in Palm Bay, and we sell them in West Melbourne. And we've been doing this for about six years now. Um, and so we are here to talk to you today about what you plant and how much it matters. 
Like <laughs> it really is important that you think about what you're planting. And of course, you know, obviously we think native plants are the best, but we're going to talk to you about that and why. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So the first thing that you have to do is know what you're planting. And these are some category or the categories of plants that you find here and everywhere. Um, so we're in Florida. So our Florida native plants are the plants that um, their native range has included Florida since before the Europeans got here. So they've been growing here for a long time. Nobody brought them here. They got here by themselves. <clears throat> And then you have exotic plants, which are from different parts of the world. Um, some of them are native to their area. Some are created and bred to be ornamental plants. And these are plants that have been brought to Florida either on purpose or accidentally. And so these exotic plants, a lot of them live in landscapes and they have to be maintained. But then a lot of them have gotten out of our landscapes. And they don't have to be maintained. And these are what we call naturalized exotics. So naturalized exotics, they can sustain their cell, themselves and their populations outside of our like maintained landscapes. And they reproduce. They reproduce without any help from us. But they're not necessarily like causing too much of a problem. They're just there. Yeah. And that's compared to invasive exotics, which have decided to spread exponentially in Florida. And as opposed to naturalized exotics, which are just spreading in kind of widespread, but in rural sites, not necessarily in plant communities, but invasive exotics are spreading on its own within native plant communities. And there is the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council, who has categorized these, ex these particular exotic plants as either category one invasive exotics or category two invasive exotics. And the difference between them is that a category one invasive exotic is currently altering plant communities and ecosystems in Florida. They're changing ecolo ecological function or they're hybridizing with current native plant or native plants. And this has been documented through research and they're actually disturbing native plant communities where category two invasive exotics are increasing in abundance, but have not yet altered the Florida native plant communities, but they're getting in to the native plant communities and starting to spread. And a lot of times they eventually become a category one, which are actually causing ecological damage. And so there's a scale that invasion biologists use to measure in plant invasions. And so if a plant spreads more than 100 meters within 50 years, then it is considered becoming an invasive plant. And that's for plants that spread from seed. And plants that spread from rhizomes or, prop or root spreading, they like to measure these plants as they spread, if they spread more than six meters in every three years, then they're considering them as invading current native plant communities. So we wanted to introduce or show you some native, some exotic plants that hopefully you know. So these are both category one invasive species. This is rosary pea with the nice shiny little red berries. This is a vine. It's been here for a long time and it's covering a lot of things. So it's very vigorous, very hard to get out. It's perennial and it's covering landscapes. Same with the Australian pine. It was brought here. It was planted here for um, a reason to block wind and then it spread itself out into the landscape. And it has become a significant problem in a lot of our landscapes, natural and just around in urban areas. Brazilian pepper. I hope everybody has seen this one and knows it, but we can't forget it. Spread vastly by birds, definitely spreads further than 100 meters in 50 years. And 
a major problem, very toxic, grows like crazy everywhere. Um, old, world, old world climbing fern, another category one invasive species. As you can see, it's pretty covering. It has definitely altered this ecosystem. The environmental function of this ecosystem has drastically changed because of this plant. <coughs> Carrotwood. It's an ornamental tree. It was an ornamental tree. It was brought here. It was pretty. It's a pretty tree. Look at those pretty yellow berries. But the same thing, it's spread by birds. And this one has um, altered mangrove habitats. It's invaded the mangroves pretty, dis um, uh, and, you know, it's taken over the mangroves. And so it's changing the function of the mangrove communities. An air potato. You've ever seen air potato? Pretty little hard shaped leaf, very ornamental looking, but boy, can it make a mess out of everything. <laughs> so these are ones that we hope that you've seen. So you probably know about these invasive species. They are illegal to sell, illegal to propagate. There are laws against them to be selling and putting them out in nature. But did you know there are plenty more that are being sold in many other nurseries that you can still purchase any in most nurseries, Home Depot, Walmart, and a lot of other typical nurseries. Oyster plant has just been changed in 2019 from a category two into a category one. So it has now been documented to be disrupting native plant ecosystems. You can buy this plant anywhere. So this is why we've titled our presentation, What You Plant Matters, because in our line of work, what we've been doing over the past six years People invite us to their yards for a consult. We go into their yards and we see their backyard just completely full <laughs> of not only invasive plants that are getting there, that are getting there by themselves, like Brazilian pepper and birds are moving them, but they're also buying category one invasive plants at their local nursery and planting them in their yard. So oyster plant, Mexican petunia, lantana camara, these are all still category one invasive species that should not be purchased and planted anywhere in Florida. Um, and hopefully, and we can figure out how to get people to eventually make these also illegal to propagate and sell. And then we also have a lot of people who want to create food forests. So food forests are great. Uh, but you have to be careful because there are a lot of fruit trees that become invasive. So we have strawberry guava, category one, tasty, but should not be planted. There are alternatives. And Suriname cherry, quite a long history of invasiveness with Suriname cherry. But you can still purchase both of these species. Asparagus fern, in 2017, the Pest Plant Council had it as a category two. Now, in 2019, the most recent list, it's a category one because it has finally been shown and documented that it is altering ecosystems. And so instead of continuing to buy it until it finally destroys ecosystems, we need to quit purchasing these plants and not put them. And camphor tree is a very large shade tree that has lots of berries and the birds love the berries but we don't want to feed the birds those berries because they're taking them into our natural florida hammocks and these large trees are out competing native plant communities and malaleuca so most people have probably heard about the malaleuca the paper bark tree it was brought here to drain the everglades and blah 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 but it didn't really work and so now south florida is full of these trees and then we have to get rid of them and they've been invasive for a long time, and we've all known that. But then there's another Malaleuca that most people are not familiar is a Malaleuca, the bottle brush tree. This is a Malaleuca. It has not been reproducing in our landscape. It has been sterile. It has not been getting pollinated until recently. Change in climate, something. Something has changed, most likely the climate. This plant is now producing seeds. It was a species of concern. Now in 2019, um, it was listed. It is now a category two invasive species. So that means like we were saying, category two very quickly often turned to category one. So this is now a species we really don't wanna be propagating, promoting, harboring in our landscape. 
if you have a landscape full of invasives and exotics, we like to call them, in, it's called environmental pollution because you're just feeding all of these seeds basically out into the landscape. So we ask ourselves, why does everybody like these plants? Why are these exotic plants loved so much? And actually, the truth of the matter is, the ornamental market, the horticulture in industry, has been selecting for these characteristics that are potentially invasive. These characteristics are repeated blooming, so they bloom all the time. You're gonna have a flower every day of the year, yay! Long blooming periods, low maintenance. Oh boy, everybody wants low maintenance. We don't wanna to have to do anything to them. They can grow anywhere. Wide adaptability, it can be in the sun, it can be in the shade, you know? Super adaptable, it doesn't matter where we plant it, it'll grow. Ease of propagation, that means they grow really easily. You can make cuttings, you can give away cuttings to people, you can propagate, you know, little seeds sprout up everywhere, super easy to propagate. Stress tolerant, really hot, really sunny, really dry, hurricanes, they still survive. A short juvenile period means it grows really fast. So you plant a little seedling and bam, you get a bush or a tree or a shrub really fast. So these are things that sound good, but maybe so, not so much. Yep. Yeah, so, and, and then last con but not consumer least. demand kind of drives all of these factors. And so the ornamental characteristics that are being selected by the horticulture industry are the same characteristics that make their probability of becoming invasive more likely. And so through consumer demand, we have people buying these plants and they like them. And so it's a profitable industry. And so they bring in more of them. And so the process of invasion is the area occupied versus time. And so if you have, and there's a graph, but I don't have a, but it is a called a sigmoidal curve where you have a, a slight increase in expen exponential growth and then it flattens off at high, really high up. And so this is the curve for invasive species. And if you are selling a plant, if somebody brings a plant in from another part of the world and they start selling it and people don't really like it very much, they'll sell it for a year and it may have the potential to be invasive, but it doesn't become invasive because a year or two demand goes down. They don't like the plant. And so, it kind of goes out of the away. But if there's high consumer demand, people love the flowers. They want to see this bloom all the time, like the lantana. There's a really high consumer demand. So decades and decades of planting this plant increases the probability of it getting out into conservation land and state parks and wildlife management areas because of the number of plants that are actually being put out into the environment into people's yards. So then, if everybody likes them, what's the big problem? Why should we care about these? Well, because <laughs> they spread and they take over large areas. And now the state has to spend millions of dollars getting rid of them every year. And these are all taxpayers' dollars. So that's one good reason not to have them here. And they can be super hazardous. All that extra biomass can be a huge fire problem. And then in the waterways, there's all sorts of, of exotics in the waterways that can stop water flow and create flooding and all that. Um, and then the University of South Florida um, put out this statement saying that one third of all plants growing wild in Florida are non-natives. And so that could cause a significant problem to a lot of things. That's a lot of plants that are not native out there. <clears throat> so here lies our problem. But this can also be our solution. These are all people who have backyards and front yards that they can choose what they're going to put in these yards. And then these yards can be landscaped in a way that they can support things instead of not support things. But this is where it's really important about what you choose because what you plant matters because if this is what your art ends up looking like so 
We have habitat loss from development and then replacement with exotic non-supportive plants. So non-supportive plants is another category. We put that in exotics because they're not supporting the ecosystem and they're not supporting the animals that need the native plants. So who can live here? Most of these plants are from either South, Southeast Asia, South America, very large um, tropical habitats. They're not native plants. So our native creatures don't know how to use them. Okay. So when you have a development, this is what you find in the horticulture industry. Exotic plants, bougainvillea, arbicola, split leaf philodendron, and crotons and Thai plants. And our pollinators don't know how to use these plants. The birds are not going to be able to use these plants for berries. So is this habitat? Who could live here? Who can live in this? Not our people. <laughs> no, I mean, not, not, our, our critters. not our critters. They don't know what to do here. So if we go into a backyard and we see this, we have coined this Which we term and we call lot. this a tropical paradise disaster. <laughs> it's pretty. It's got big leaves. It's super lush and green and gorgeous. It's very inviting. But it's for also super creepy because there's no life out there. Nothing. There's is, no bees. Well, very little animals are living in this. It's just very empty. You've got a lawn surrounded by large lush green leaves and big ferns. Looks like life might be in there somewhere. Looks maybe but inviting. I don't see any capybaras <laughs> and I don't see any monkeys in there. And so people have asked us and we have gone to people's yards and they say, where are the birds? Or are there birds beachside? Because I don't see them out here on the barrier islands. Are there even birds? Yeah, because we'll we'll go to a consult and go into their backyard and we will see this and we'll be like, oh, you should plant some fire bush or some fiddlewood, something with berries. And they'll look at us like we're crazy because they actually don't think birds can live there, li would be living there. So <laughs> it's true. Where are the birds? I mean, bird populations have declined drastically since the 1970s. And one of the main reasons that our bird populations in North America are declining is habitat loss. So we want to fix that, obviously, or we want to do our part to support populations of birds and butterflies and bees. And so there's this new movement called the Homegrown National Park. And this is a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard. You can be responsible. We want to restore biodiversity one yard at a time. And so all those houses we looked at earlier, if they all do something, help to join the movement to restore biodiversity, we can make a difference. So how do we go about doing that? Anybody have any great ideas, <laughs> hint, hint? Well, you could plant native plants in your yard. For the birds. Imagine that. Plants native to your plant native plants for the bees. For the bees. Yep. And plant native plants for the trees. For the trees. So these are young trees. I always remind people, plant new trees. Because the best plant time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. And the second best time is now. So we have to always be planting new trees, and even if you have even if you have large pine trees and oak trees in your yard, they may be reaching maturity. So it's good to let the babies grow if they show up on their own or plant new trees for the future. So by planting native plants, you'll bring life to your landscape. You will be supporting life in your landscape. These little white caterpillars, these are zebra longwing caterpillars on a native passion vine. If all you have is split leaf philodendron, these guys can't use it. They don't eat split leaf phil philodendron. This little cat bird is eating a beauty berry berry and they're not gonna be able to eat anything off a, a um, arbicola. <laughs> and this is the endangered Atala butterfly, which hosts on the Quinty, the Quinty plant. The Quinty is our cycad, native to Florida. <clears throat> they only lay their eggs on Quinty's. If it's full of, Bougainvilleas and Crotons, you're certainly not going to have any Atalas. 
And this little native bee on the Stokes Aster is collecting pollen and nectar. And they can't even get into um, crepe myrtle flowers. Not crepe myrtles. Oh. Yeah, crepe myrtles. Crepe myrtles and that works. The other ones. Bougainvilleas. Bougainvilleas. <laughs> they don't. There's not pollen available. You may get, get some. Get you may get some frogs in your banana trees, but most likely they'll end up being Cuban, Cuban free frogs <laughs> instead of native Florida tree frogs. Oddly enough. So, what you plant matters to these little guys and to lots of other things, including us. But it's interesting because not all plants are oh, created yes. equal. And you can still, even if you plant native plants, if it was a yard full of cinnamon ferns, you still wouldn't have much life. So you, in order to create and attract the most abundant life, there's still some groupings of native plants that you have to lean towards. And so plant keystone plant species. So a keystone species is a plant or animal that has a disproportionate value of influence on that ecosystem. That means it's giving a lot back. Lots of things use it for something. <clears throat> and so we have a live oak here, which is a very important species. And then specialists. So specialists, mostly pollinators, um, bees, butterflies, and birds, they are specialized. They have special relationships with one type of plant. And if you plant a specialist, you're helping, or I mean, you're planting a plant that is for specialists. You're helping that specialist. And you're also helping the generalists who use the plants. So goldenrod, there's lots of bees that only use goldenrod. So it's a great specialist plant. So specialization is one of the beauties of nature. And this is a quote from Dr. Doug Tallamy who wrote a few really great books and one of them is nature's best hope. And it's, this one is a bit sarcastic It's talking about specialization. So what he's saying is how easy conservation would be if all plants delivered the same benefits, ecological benefits. And if all plants were equivalent to each other, then we could plant eucalyptus around the whole world and all the plant eaters would be happy as koalas. We could plant nectar filled butterfly bush and that so many people use and always ask us for to help butterflies. And they would serve as the larval host plant for all butterflies, but they don't. And they would deliver up pollen and nectar for all 4,000 species of native bees, but they don't. And the resplendent quetzal would be as common as starlings because it would be able to eat the fruit of all plants instead of only wild avocado. So even birds are specialists. Animals and plants have evolved for so long they've specialized through competition. We could rename the evening primrose moth the every plant moth. And the ornamental bamboos that are consuming yards and roadways would feed monarchs like milkweeds. So it's a great quote from Nature's Best Hope. And this is part of Dr. Doug Tallamy's research. He's a professor of entomology in the University of Delaware, and he is promoting planting native plants because of his research. He's been an entomologist for 30 years. And this is a list of keystone species that his group of researchers have found. These are for, for North America. So the genus oaks, they found over 557 different species of moths will use oaks specifically. So they're very specialized on the genus oak. So you have cherries. So the number next to the names is the number of species of moths that they found their caterpillars on these trees and plants eating the leaves. So they're hosting on it. Cherries, willows, maples, blueberries, hickories, and elms. These are all extremely, and pines, and all these others are the top host plants and keystone, keystone species. They hold up ecosystems. And the reason why is because baby birds need <laughs> caterpillars. The reason why moths are important is because they lay thousands of eggs. That's their survival mechanism. It's kind of like sea turtles. They'll lay thousands of eggs on an oak tree. We never know they're there, but the birds know that they're there. And they can, 
they use those caterpillars to feed the baby birds that they're raising in their chicks. So part of Doug Tallamy's study was uh, a nest of chickadees, or a few, that he was his graduate students were watching and counting the number of caterpillars and almost only caterpillars brought back to the nest. They would bring back between 400 to 570 different uh, caterpillars per day. It takes about 16 days to raise a nest of three chickadees. That's between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars just for one nest. These all come from keystones. Most of them are coming from keystone species like the oaks, the cherries, the maples, and the willows. So when we talked to you about wildlife friendly yards, we made a list of guidelines. So when we're thinking about attracting things to our yard, we want to make it, we want to bring the circle of life into your, our yards and we want to be able to support what's coming to our yard so they can have everything they need to fill all of their needs for their life. And so <clears throat> when, you are, when you're designing your landscape, putting it in layers is really important. You don't wanna just have the overstory or you don't wanna just have the understory. You've gotta have the canopy the understory and the herbaceous layer. So, because there's birds that only go in the canopy and there's butterflies that only use the herbaceous layer. And so to have it all there, you've got to mix it all together. You need to have moth and butterfly host plants. You've got to have plants that use, that provide berries for the birds and seeds. You have to have plants for nesting and cover. And then the herbaceous layer, which is where most of the nectar is, but not all, but most of it. And the only way to achieve this, moth and butterfly host plants, berries for the birds at the right time of year when they're migrating through or when they're raising their young or the special time of the year is by using native plants. Am I continuing? Yeah, so this is another picture of the live oak. It hosts 550, not the live oak, but oaks in general host 550 different species of moth caterpillars, apples, it's an example of the red maple, 297 different species of caterpillars. Willows, um, this is Carolina willow. They grow in moist areas. They only get about 15 feet here. Um, these guys are host of 455 different species of caterpillars, mainly moth caterpillars, but also the viceroy caterpillar. There is a butterfly that posts on the willows. This is the viceroy, the mon monarch mimic. So then we want to show you some plants that are good for berries and birds. <clears throat> We've already seen our lovely little cat bird eating the beauty berry. So the beauty berry is an understory plant. So Tim talked about a few of the re really good overstory and canopy trees, and then a couple midstory. So this is a midstory. This goes under the trees. It grows in the in the shady layer. And look at all those berries. So many berries. You could have any bird you want come through here and it could eat as many as it wants and it would be good for them. They would be full and they would go away and they would come back next year when they're migrating. So these guys put out during during migration season, which is really important to feed the migrated, migratory birds. <clears throat> Simpson stopper, another really wonderful native plant. You can see grows about 20, 25 feet at its most at its max. So this is considered an understory, mid-story plant. Really beautiful white fragrant flowers, so it smells great. And look at those big juicy red berries or orange berries. And these actually, just a side note, are edible for humans. They are in the guava family. Um, and so they also provide berries during migratory season. <clears throat> Great food crop for the berry for the birds, and also nectar for your pollinators and your butterflies. <clears throat> Firebush, we've probably all seen it. It's such a wonderful plant. Everything uses it. Look at those big juicy berries. It'll grow in the sun or in like partial shade in the understory. It's about 10 to 12, maybe 15 feet. <clears throat> and butterflies, bees, hummingbirds, um, mockingbirds, any kind of birds. Everybody uses this bush. It's such a wonderful attractor for any kind of life, really. <clears throat> Christmas berry, a very salt tolerant, grows in the marshes around the lagoon. 
lovely little purple flowers and big red, red juicy berries. Another great one for areas that is more salty, a little bit harsher <coughs> climate uh, environments. Fiddlewood, super fragrant. Look at those berries, feed all the birds. Any <laughs> bird that wants to come through your yard can have a berry and a caterpillar because this is also a moth house plant and it can provide a lot of caterpillars for any bird that wants to come through your yard. Lot. A lot of caterpillars. <laughs> and it's super fragrant. <laughs> So this one does need more sun, doesn't really like the shade as much, but um, a really another beautiful shrub. Not not overstory, not ground layer, middle story. Mid story. And then vines. So this is the Corky Stem Passion Vine, the little white caterpillar I was talking to you about, loves these guys. The Corky Stem Passion Vine grows in the sun or the shade. You can see the little flower there. <clears throat> And then those big juicy berries and the cardinal go gobbling up some berries. Um, so this is a host plant for the zebra longwing and the gulf artillery and a few other longwings. And then it's also a really good plant for the birds. A great vine to have in any landscape. <clears throat> so for plants, you also should be planting for nesting and cover to create this homegrown national park on your little piece of property. No matter how big it is, you can be a part of Homegrown National Park. If you do the layered landscape, you have to add plants that provide cover and opportunities for birds to nest. So wax myrtle is a great nesting shrub. It's stiffly branched. So here we have a vireo that made a little basket nest on a wax myrtle. They also have berries. Um, wax wings. And the cedar wax wings would be gobbling up these berries, also swallows. They know to look for these berries at the right time of year because their ancestors are doing it and their ancestors are doing it and their ancestors are doing it. And also Florida privet is anytime you look into a Florida privet shrub, you'll probably see an old mockingbird nest. This is one of their favorite shrubs to nest. It's very stiffly branched. So Frozen they're always branches. going in there and building uh, nests. They also have berries, juicy berries, and they're a great pollinator plant whenever they flower. They're beautiful yellow flowers and the, the pollinators are all over them. And sweet acacia, it's great for the pollinators, but this is excellent bird nesting. Uh, small tree, tall shrub or briar tangle. The birds love to nest in sweet acacia as well there. They have thorns that help keep the snakes and the cats out. Um, and the flowers smell really good. And saw palmetto. Saw palmetto is also a host plant. It's a host plant to a couple of skipper butterflies, the monk skipper and the palmetto skipper butterfly. And this, the saw palmetto is considered one of the, or the most important wildlife plant in Florida. Whenever it's flowering, it attracts over 150 different species of pollinators. It produces lots of fiber as it grows that birds and other animals use for nesting. And then it's also a great host plant. So then we come to our herbaceous layer. And this is normally the nectar layer. <clears throat> as you can see, this is where we have most of our color. Um, Trees and shrubs do flower, but the wildflowers on the ground layer are definitely where the flower, the color shows up in the landscape. Um, and so this low layer, you can have so much diversity in the sunny, open, low areas in your garden or like where you want your plants to be low. <clears throat> so this is um, partridge pea and caryopsis and the purple ones are coastal verbena. Here we have another little poolside um, herbaceous layer. The tall yellow ones in the front are lakeside sunflower. Behind it is the native porterweed. And then that's a massive clump of blue curl. And blue curl, for every seed, there's for every flower, there's four seeds. So small birds love these seeds. When you let the after it flowers and it goes to seed, if you let that plant sit there with its with its seed um, heads on it, it can attract all sorts of little birds who are migrating. And this is a fall bloomer. And so then once it's done flowering, all those seeds are available 
in the fall and winter months for those little migratory birds that are coming through here or overwintering here. <clears throat> we always want to think about planting different colors and different sizes and different shapes for biodiversity in the landscape. So the snow square stem has a little tubular flower and the bladder mallow has a big, wide, flat, open face flower. And so the, the or actually it's a small flower, but it's an open face flower. Um, and so pollinators can land on the open face flowers. Where the tubular flowers, they often like to hover. There are butterflies and pollinators that hover while feeding. And then there are other ones that like to land and walk around on the flower. So keeping that in mind, you want different shapes and colors in your landscape. <clears throat> Here's our, the yellow one is our native Caryopsis, our um, Florida's state wildflower. A fabulous pollinator plant. It's an it's a, um, annual and it does reseed itself, but it's very prolific and it likes um, moist areas full, and mostly full sun. The middle one is horse mint. Um, this is a hub of life when it's, when it's flowering. It flowers in the late summer to fall. And there are so many different species of bees and, and different um, butterflies nectaring on these. It's just mesmerizing to watch. And you can see this bumblebee here is just diving into that um, <laughs> spotted horse mint flower. And then the Florida paintbrush. See, they're big, open, flat landing surfaces where they can land and crawl around on the face of the plant, or, I mean, of the flower, so that they can pick up the pollen and dip their, their nose into the nectar and they don't have to be hovering, hovering all the time. <clears throat> so for dry landscapes, um, scrub mints, this actually is Conradina, our namesake here. This is a wonderful bee plant. The bumblebees will just dive into that little hole there and just bury themselves in the, in the, in the flower. False indigo. This is a great shrub. It's a nectar plant and a host plant. This is a host plant to a hair streak. And those big purple flower spikes get visited by all sorts of uh, nectaring insects and pollinators. And this is a great one for ones that want to hover, who don't want to land. Um, they can fly around the flower spike and drink nectar while they're flowering, flying. <clears throat> Yellow top of fall bloomer, like a little bit moist and full sun areas, becomes covered in yellow flowers and just completely crawling and flying and jumping with little little pollinators when it is flowering. So it's a heavy load of nectar, tons of pollen, and just alive with life. <clears throat> oh. So uh, what are we going to say to people whenever they try to sell us non-native plants? <laughs> <laughs> so we got this off of Homegrown National Park's Instagram page. And this is what we're trying to express to people as when they come into our nursery we have to tell them it is very important to buy native plants to plant native plants in your landscape because it has a big effect to the broader landscape to the conservation land to state parks and and protected land around the state by not planting exotics you know you're not planting in potential invasive plants and by not planting non-supportive plants, you're planting supportive plants that are going to help hold up an ecosystem. They're going to help all of our little pollinators, all of the critters here that we have around us that we want to keep their populations up. And so if you're an invasive plant, you can talk to the hand. <laughs> So that's <laughs> wrapping up our presentation. Um, you can come see us at our store. We have a store in West Melbourne on Irwin Avenue, just off of 192. Um, our store hours are Saturday from 9 to 2 and Monday from 9 to 4. And we'll be happy to talk to you about any of our pollinator plants and native plants and trees and shrubs and ground covers. And don't ask us for any invasives. And we got this idea because that what you plant matters because we are traveling to different neighborhoods every single week and we see the same plants in these backyards in engulfing their backyards from 
10 years ago where somebody just happened to put oh, oh I just, I'll just i just threw this i just out sat there this over there sculpture. and now it's climbed the entire yard and so these plants are uh, quite aggressive so know what you're planting <laughs> know what you're planting. because what you plant really matters that is excellent <laughs> Oh, you guys are so funny because I'm ready to put my hand up and say, yes. <laughs> talk to the hand. <laughs> I love that last line where, That's great. oh my gosh, they have to be taught people that come there. I'm hoping it's only 50% that are like, what, what is a native plant? It's been here that long. Well, yeah. we just went over here to Home Depot and got this. No, yeah. no, yeah. no, don't do it. No. No. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that was very informative, you know, to first to say what not to plant and then to say, put this in the ground. And um, Talame is just, yeah. he's done great research and he has those great quotes that we can, we can quote. And, um, it, it's it's really helping fun. guide communication, I think. So it's Any, yes. yeah, makes it very friendly and, and knowledgeable and, yeah. um, you know, you guys did a great job. You had some great pictures. It really shows us what we should put in our yard and what we should not put in our yard. So we'll have to have our hands <laughs> up and go, don't put that in there. No, and, don't do it. Save yourself. Even yeah. if your neighbor is giving it to you. That's right. You have to put your hand yeah. up. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> <laughs> or you could just take it and put it in your garbage. There you That's go. Right. That's right. Even better. <laughs> Well, that's great. Um, we uh, have had some on the side, you know, I'm just going to pop a couple of these up that I don't think you you can see, but great presentation. Um, thank you, Tim and Anna. Uh, great presentation is another one. Thank you for your hard work. Oh, Tim thank and you, Anna. guys. Thank and you guys. Um, this one is also, thank you, Anna. Thank and you, Tim. Carl. Great presentation. <laughs> yep. Um, <laughs> And I had to throw one in when you had that great picture. When I said, "Yay, you have yeah, that's right. <laughs> that was a great picture as well." Um, so we definitely, um, you know, have fun with all that. So, um, you know, you guys have know done a great say. job, and um, you know, we look forward to you. Uh, check our newsletter because you can see exactly ah, okay. who they are and when you can go there and get some native plants. Yeah. So. Um, I think we're all said it's all been just compliment compliments about your um presentation. So I guess we're closing a, a uh a close down. Um just to tag it in here that next Sunday, not next Sunday, but Sunday in June is our bring your own lunch at Erna Nixon Park. So that's Sunday, June 13th. And you can check our website for that. So Thank you so much, Tim and Anna. You thank you for well. inviting us. <laughs> Educated a lot of people. And thanks, everybody, for coming in and watching us. And um, plant native. Plant native. Thanks, guys. <laughs>